Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. This is Michael Henry, and this is an update on the Kansas City Digital Drive Education Team MOOC prog project. And what we're going to be doing today is mostly talking about a uh, progress report on our activities. And I think I just heard Aaron Deacon uh, chime in. Is that you, Aaron? It is. Oh, excellent. We are just starting, Aaron. And um, so what we're going to do is um, I'm going to introduce, do introductions uh, first. Um, we have uh, Michael Porterfield and also Aaron Deacon on the panel. And uh, Michael, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself first and just tell us just a little bit about your situation, uh, not the situation, but your uh, your role there in uh, St. Louis at UMSL. Sure, I wish it looked like the situation, but um, that was a joke. Yeah. Uh, my name is Michael Porterfield. I um, am an instructional designer and with the Center for Teaching and Learning in St. Louis, Missouri at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And I am an instructional designer, so I work with faculty um, that move, transition their course from online or from face to face to online. So um, we step them through, and um, yeah, it's a little bit about whatever. That's what I do. Great. And then Aaron, uh, we've we obviously we're looking at slides here, but uh, we do have uh, some slides about Kansas City Digital Drive and also about. Google Fiber, and can you talk just a little bit, introduce yourself, and then uh, share just a little bit about uh, the Casey Digital Drive, what it is, and also uh, where it's going, sort of the most recent activity. Sure. Casey uh, Digital Drive um, has come out of a long process that started with Google Fiber choosing the Kansas City Metro for its uh, initial deployment. Um, uh, Mayor Reardon from Kansas City, Kansas, and Mayor James from Kansas City, Missouri, uh, appointed a, a bi-state task force to uh, start thinking about what the region should be doing to capitalize on that infrastructure. Uh, I had been involved in uh, in that question in a number of different ways. I ended up getting engaged with the task force and ultimately um, hired to head up KC Digital Drive, um, which is an implementation initiative for the playbook that that mayoral task force produced last summer. Uh, so they put out a big list of recommendations uh, against four strategic uh, areas, digital inclusion and digital literacy, next generation application development, uh, economic development, and uh, sort of gave it city uh, formation and, and leadership. Um, within the next generation application development, uh, we've established a lot of local work groups in education, in healthcare, in the arts, in gaming, uh, and are looking for opportunities in each of those areas. And so uh, this Gigabit MOOC project fits pretty squarely uh, into that process um, that met Michael uh, Henry through that work. And so we're very interested in seeing how um, you know some of the shortcomings of the MOOC model might be able to be addressed in a better bandwidth environment. Great. And uh, since um, I, I, I'm more uh, specifically involved with the education co committee or the education group of uh, Casey Digital Drive, can you share, and actually I think I've missed the last two meetings, can you share just a little bit about what's kind of happening in the, uh, the education world in terms of uh, recent, recent activity? Yeah, well, it's interesting. You know, there's a lot of different facets of education, and we have a group, the our education group that has been meeting, has largely focused on K through 12. Uh, we've had some engagement with the university community, and even that has largely been, uh, you know, how do you educate K through 12 teachers? So thinking about the education department of um, of higher ed, uh, we haven't, at least the the current group that we have together, hasn't done quite as much with. Um, you know, the development of uh, uh, university MOOCs for university students, uh, at least collectively. There's, there's a lot of interest in the lessons, and I think that's where Michael's head's a little bit more, um, and, and kind of the, the project that we've been involved with has been, uh, and, and certainly, you know, the, the, the short history of MOOCs is more towards adult and, and higher ed education uh, than, than elementary and, and high school students. Uh, but we're interested to see kind of how to match those things together and, and really to use this project
project as a way to engage the higher ed community. There's been, we, we do have an additional higher ed group, um, and a lot of that conversation is a little bit more about workforce development um, than sort of classroom redesign and, and uh, you know, pedagogical implications, at least the conversations that we're having here locally. Um, but it all ties together eventually. Right. But, <laughs> right. A wide ranging answer, but, but maybe that gets at what you're talking about, Michael. That's great. And Aaron, I should point out that that we I did uh, mention to everyone earlier that we are recording this session, so we're uh, going to m publish it later. So uh, just so you're aware, uh, the agenda for today we're just very very quickly going to go through, uh, make sure that we're all on the same page when we say MOOC because it's it's a changeable kind of term, frankly. Uh, talk uh, really about the design and technology issues related to to MOOCs, but then in terms of universities, uh, uh, the primary problem for most universities and academic institutions is a business model. If we're well, we'll talk about that in a little bit, and then uh, at the end we talk about and we're going to keep this to um, under an hour. Uh, development reports and talk about you know specific developments, and that's where Michael. Uh, uh, Porterfield will share also what's happening in at UMSL in uh, St. Louis. And then also dis, uh, discussion and, and in, invite people to share uh, collaborative opportunities. What kind of opportunities are available uh, in terms of collaboration and development of these community uh, MOOCs. Uh, so I'm just going to very briefly just uh, touch on what is a MOOC, Massively Open Online Course. And it really grew out of this idea that education is an open e experience that really we don't just get educated in the classroom, we get educated everywhere. Um, so it's really a, a process of uh, being in an open source kind of environment. Uh, we're also looking at sort of the pedagogical and technical technological issues related to MOOCs. Um, the role of the instructor, what is the role of the instructor? Uh, there have been a, def a couple of different kinds of MOOCs that have been discussed in our groups before. One is a C MOOC, which is sort of that traditional instructor-led. Um, it, it can feel like you're just basically clicking through lots of presentations and taking an examination. Um, then there's the X MOOC, which uh, can be more uh, experiential. And then we've even included a, a, a social m openly online course. So uh, looking at the ability for social learning to, to be used as, to be leveraged as a tool uh, in that MOOC environment. Uh, so the, there are also ventures that have been spending a lot of money on the development of MOOCs. There's Coursera and edX. Uh, there are lots of them out there. Um, and also from an academic institution, the interesting uh, points to look at are assessment, credentialing, copyright, and also um, dealing with, with laws such as FERPA laws, uh, which are required to protect the identity of the students from the general public. So there are lots of issues to be dealt with in a MOOC, especially when you would combine them with uh, the higher ed community. There are some great articles out there uh, for those who are sort of interested in, in the issues related to MOOCs. Uh, John During has, has produced a great article called Effective Habits of Power Users, and he did a lot of research uh, interviewing and uh, surveying um, existing professors who have done MOOCs to come up with some trend lines in terms of how MOOCs are used. Um, then also uh, the Inside of uh, Education um, uh, magazine put out a Beyond a MOOC hype and really looked at where practically this is going. And then uh, another article that I highly recommend is professors who, who make the MOOCs and this is in the Chronicle of Higher Education. And again, that's a good study, sort of showing the, the, the practice of putting together a MOOC and the reflective experience of what that meant after the MOOC was put together. So the issues uh, really that come out of this these articles and the issues we're still dealing with, Aaron and Michael, I'm happy to have either of you comment on this, are the issues of an instructional design platform. It seems almost as though the platform itself is, it, it's, it's part of the learning experience. And when you put out a course on a certain kind of platform, it reflects the type of learning that goes on in that course. And then also the business model. How, 
how do people get paid? How do you pay professors? How do you pay salaries? How do you pay brick and mortar institutions when you're essentially giving away the curriculum? Michael, do you want to, to comment on the, are these issues that you're also seeing in the, in the UMSL kind of world for MOOC development? I mean, what we're facing right now, I mean, the inevitable question is we're talking about maybe having a, a very limited um, course that's only open to maybe hopefully about 200 people into our, um, to our alumni or to professional, you know, students, or sorry, to our alumni from the College of Education for professional development. And so as we're bouncing around ideas to offer this, hopefully an early part of next year, you know, some of the questions are, you know, the inevitable question is, can I get credit for this? Right. You know, because teacher salaries are based on how much professional development they do and how many classes they have. So those bring in questions about, um, you know, is this going to be, is this the person who's taking this class and credentialing and the Higher Learning Commission? Right. You know, how is this, how are, how are they going to pay for it? You know, so it's just all these questions are starting to be, you know, asked, and they're very good and valid questions. And so those are kind of questions that we're, um, you know, trying to um, struggle with. Right. Um, but we are commit, committed to hosting, you know. Um, but I think those are some questions that we need to and need to uh, face as we're looking at this, you know, credentialing and stuff. And Aaron, it's, I mean, so. I, yeah, thank you, Michael. And Aaron is, it, it, I think it's safe to say, especially on the Kansas City Digital Drive uh, initiative of the Education Committee, we, we've seen very little, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be critical because there's a lot going on on the uh, university and higher ed side of things, but we've not seemed to connect that well with higher education and it may be these particular issues what kind of feedback are you hearing from the higher ed type institutions i would say um in general uh you don't hear much feedback from any institution on uh next generation network related activity unless you really push them for it uh, because uh, everyone has, has sort of their own bucket of stuff that they're working on. Um, and even though in some ways, uh, you know, gigabit home internet is upon us here in Kansas City, it's still limited to, you know, probably less than 10,000 households and no institution institutional hookups yet uh, to speak of. So, so there's just not a lot of urgency. And even if they did have the connections, um, you know, it still comes very much within... Uh, you know the scope of how, how does this uh, interact with with whatever I'm already doing, uh, and we see this uh, even on a on a K through 12 level, which is is where um, I've focused probably more of my energy uh, than the higher ed, uh, just because they have less sort of resources and less uh, ability to do it, and also you know there's there's when you think about sort of public education for second and third graders. Uh, or, or high school students, um, you know, there's real high potential for social impact. Uh, but I think the question, um, maybe so, so that kind of gets to, to, to thinking about, you know, the next generation of technology, uh, especially next generation network technology. But beyond that, um, you know, with all the, the the new technology coming into the classroom, you know, it's obviously a hot button. There's a lot of people talking about it. There's a lot of thought about, you know, professional development uh, and what teachers need to do in order to, to adapt. But, you know, there's still a lot of questions about what, what actually makes a difference and what actually moves the needle. And so I think that's kind of the opportunity in front of us, you know, with this, with, with the MOOC question. You know, there's, there's obviously something substantive there. Um, there's opportunities available, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of people doing this and trying it out. Um, but, you know, to your point, I mean, part of it, part of it is the business model uh, that hasn't quite been identified, but it's also a question of what is actually going to be effective uh, to educate people. Um, and so I think there is a lot of uh, exploring that can be done. I think the hope is that as the technology advances, we're able to do things that make um, you know, the program itself more effective and, and either 
Uh, you know, they, they talk about cheaper, faster, better. You know, you got to hit one of those one of those pillars, and hopefully, you know, in, in my mind, um, you know, we really think about better. What can you do to improve on an educational experience? Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean um, delivering a course to 10,000 people, but even if you have a classroom right now where you have 200 people, and you know, people talk about the, the large-scale survey courses at public universities and things like that that have been a, a topic for criticism for, for years and years and years, can you do something within sort of a, um, you know, online learning environment to make that a better experience and a more effective experience uh, for, for training students? Oh, that's great. I think also too you have to you have to make sure that you know these larger enrollment courses that you know that you're talking about is that you know hopefully with just because you build it they might not come but if it's more if it's constructed in such a way that you know if it's more humane and if it's more engaging. I mean I've been a part of three or four MOOCs that I've never finished and I'm right. one of the normal ones. I mean I. There's a great amount of people that don't finish, you know, the MOOCs that they start. And um, so I, I think you're right. I think there is something in the business model. And how do we make sure everybody's needs are met and so that we do have completion at the end? Right. And, and that's the reason some of our discussions have uh, sort of latched onto this idea of instructional design as a, a key component to the to the MOOC experiment. And honestly, I think we're still, Aaron, and I'm sure you feel the same way, looking at this as an experiment. We're really experimenting with the the experience, trying to really push the limits on what's happening with, um, with uh, a gigabyte speeds in the online learning environment. Well, one of the things we've that we've identified is that most online courses really do have the professor as the bottleneck the professor is is really the the focus of the course and the professor is the the traffic cop of the course and the initiator of the course whereas in the MOOC model that we're looking at the more of a social experience where the subject matter experts the 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 professors are are more facilitators where they encourage exploration of the topics and then encourage students to share with other students uh, rather than performing for the professor. Um, we, we're looking at this, this idea of uh, transforming students from consumers to producers of knowledge um, and really getting rid of the, the whole idea of lectures themselves and finding ways to facilitate students so that they encourage it to they they produce and share knowledge with other mentors and teachers and facilitators and where even the students themselves become mentors to other students as they participate in the MOOC so it may be that someone quote unquote enrolls in a MOOC but soon after they're they're identified as someone with a great deal of skill or knowledge in that particular area and they become through efforts of the MOOC itself they become mentors to others in in that MOOC so the I think that the design opportunities are there for us to create something that's new and very exciting um, on the business model and we're going to come back to the panel in a second on the business model is the idea is to, and, I, and this is generally the case in MOOCs, is to have the curriculum itself be absolutely free, free and open to the public. Now that causes some problems in terms of the platform because many learning platforms have a per user fee. You have to pay somewhere along the line, you have to pay for the infrastructure to make a MOOC environment, a learning environment. And the more sophisticated they are, the more venture capital companies are charging money for each individual student. Well, if you have 5,000 students and they, it's $5 per student, you can obviously see that over time uh, that could be very expensive, especially if it increases in the number of students that are being involved. So the idea is really to have the curriculum essentially free, but then look at fee-based support for credit or for assessment. So 
it, the idea is really to have the course itself sit out in the public sphere. The course, rather than being an institutional medium, uh, a course offered by UMSL, or a course offered by Columbia, or a course offered by KU, it's actually a course that is given to the general public. And then what happens is, uh, when you get to the point of needing additional support, as additional facilitation, or additional uh, tools or evaluation, that's when a fee comes into play. So the curriculum itself is free, sits out in the public sphere, and then when you need specific tools or you need specific evaluation, there's a fee, and then you may even get to a level of assessment, certification, or facilitation when you actually need to enroll in an academic institution. So it may be that this business model can actually bring in non-traditional students um, to the university setting that would normally have not gone through the application process to become a university student, but that they are, they are facilitated through that process of becoming uh, or getting a uh, certification. So what I'd like to do now is just to turn to Michael first, if I can, and see whether or not that particular model rings true for UMSL or whether you have discussed uh, that kind of business model. I think that's um, the kind of thoughts, kind of the business model that we were talking about, you know, offering it just free and open like you talked about, Michael, and, you know, if you wanted to register for classes, you would get more personalized feedback. So um, at every level, you know, I, we would offer some type of feedback, but the more um, intensive feedback would be those that are taking it for credit. Um, so I, I, that's, we have discussed that model, and it sounds to be very good. Aaron, do you have any comments about that, or have you heard any feedback from institutions that see this as a possibility? Oh gosh, um, a lot of feedback. Um, it's it's a really tricky question because what what happens in this model is you're sort of unbundling the certification aspect of or, or the credentialing aspect that is part of the value that educational institutions provide from the actual education. Um, and I say you're doing this. I mean, this is kind of happening. Um, and, uh, and I think that's where the, the difficulty with the business model comes into play. So, you know, the MOOC specifically, you're kind of saying, well, we want to structure this in such a way that everyone can be educated, everyone has access to the content, and in fact, you can get the content and achieve the educational, you know, uh, objectives on your own and without any fee, um, but the fee comes in when you need, you know, either credit hours or some other uh, proof points that demonstrate you've gotten, you know, reach that, reach that educational watermark. Um, a couple of interesting, I don't know if they're interesting or not, but a couple of thoughts. I mean, one uh, is sort of the difference in, in credentialing or certification, which is, uh, signifying I've done, you know, task X, Y, or Z, or, or met certain, you know, a certain uh, uh, mastery of a certain skill. Um, the other is the, the bigger idea of the degree. And I think I've had some conversations with employers um, and educators both, you know, about how for all the, the talk about, um, you know, should you go to college and how expensive education is getting and what's the value of it, you know, the, the, the degree from a four-year college is still a, a pretty good predictor of success in the workforce well, on balance. And obviously, there's, there's plenty of exceptions, but uh, that's still something that a lot of people look for. And that's you know maybe changing a little bit in, in some places faster than others, but by and large, still a lot of jobs want that. So one of the interesting questions to me for a, a four-year university is how can you still provide that same value? Because that's, that's the value that... that uh, at least one way of looking at the value that people are getting from the university is, you know, a degree that they then take to the workforce to say, 
I'm, I'm going to be a better worker than somebody who doesn't have this. So as a university, can you um, offer a, uh, a degree that includes um, assessing self-taught learners in a way where you're also able to predict their success after college right. as much as you would if they were actually in your classrooms. Right, right. Right, right, and, and we're we're dealing with issues. Uh, what what, what they, we we've mentioned this before in some of our earlier meetings that this is a disruptive technology, and it's disrupting our idea of what education is. Um, because, for example, Aaron, you you mentioned workforce development and also uh, people going to uh, an employer, but many employers. Uh, seek out specific skill sets. Well, what if an employer worked with the educational institution to provide that specific skill set? And and there may be people that are actually not enrolled at the university, but are taking that professional development uh, skill set kind of development class, and then combine it with some of the uh, more traditional uh, skills that are taught on a university campus, uh, and, and but it, so it it may be a degree that is more matched to a particular uh, employer, so which would facilitate uh, workforce development. So I, I, I guess my point is that I think we're we're looking at a new future in terms of uh, how people are educated, rather than going to a brick and mortar institution for four years there may be a combination of professional development that's had uh, all over the place and and perhaps uh, two years of a, um, a more traditional experience. Uh, any comments? Otherwise, we're going to leave the business model topic and move to technology very quickly. Well, I think it's also disrupting credential or, you know, like uh, credentialing as well. I mean, the Higher Learning Commission, I mean, we're accredited by them. And so we have to make sure that, you know, if we are certifying this course and you to get credit, we need to make sure that, you know, that they are going to give us permission to do that, you know. And so, you know, there's still, I think, still, they might still have the mind frame of a brick and mortar school. And so, you know, we just need to make sure, and that's what that's the question we're at right now is, you know, will the Higher Learning Commission, if we either, we need to make sure that we settle our credentialing body and um, just to make sure that we follow their rules so that we can give credit. And, you know, so, so many people have the brick and mortar right mindset you know, it's hard to get out of that sometimes. So, right. I mean, just to get people out of that location-based education is hard enough, you know. Great. Excellent. Well, these are all great issues, and we're going to continue to, to struggle with them. Uh, let's just briefly talk also about the learning platform issue. We've, we've gone around and around with this. Um, and I, I'd be interested in hearing what uh, UMSL is planning. We, as you know, most people know, there there are lots of different platforms out there. Some of them are, are fee based. Uh, we've been since since Google Fiber is here in Kansas City. Uh, one of the sort of uh, opportunities for us was to work with uh, with Google on in terms of um, course builder using uh, Google Docs using Google. Uh, uh, social networking tools, and uh, basically using Google uh, as a, a learning management system. Uh, so we, we're sort of piloting uh, an application under Course Builder. There's a new iteration of Course Builder that just came out, and we uh, have basically been building a, a sample course um, using those tools. So they basically integrate with your Google account. So uh, you don't need to create an account on this platform. If you have a Google account, you have, uh, you, well, you can you basically click a button and you're, and you're enrolled in the, uh, the course. Um, we're also looking at ways of, of, of fine-tuning some of the features of the Google, of the Google course builder. Uh, because there are some great tools. We're actually experimenting right now with a connection between Google+, Plus, which has great 
sort of profile features and course builder to create an environment where people can find mentors and um, work with mentors. Uh, so uh, what, what I'd like to do right now is, is to sort of um, briefly ask Michael uh, about your sort of technological platform, your learning platform. There, there have been people who have, who have suggested that a MOOC is the learning platform. In other words, it's not, it's like medium is the message. It's, it's, not, it's not even the content of the course that makes a MOOC. It's the interactive social learning opportunities that makes a MOOC. Do you have any comments and on that, Mike? That's, sure. And, you know, I mean, before the show, Michael, you and I were talking about Blackboard. I mean, in, we're very entrenched in Blackboard, and we, you know, as an institution, you know, it brings a lot of, um, has a lot for us to offer our um, students. Um, sometimes um, we need to be set loose sometimes, and um, we don't want to be confined by the technology because the tech, we don't want the technology to drive uh, the direction. But I think the individuals should be in the learning, the teaching and learning should be the focus and not the LMS. And so I, I'm, as I'm hearing about your um, choices, I'm like, can I sign up? Mm -hmm. And where it sounds like, you know, the content and the creation, um, that's the direction that we're wanting to hope to go into uh, because we want to have our students, you know, that possibly will take our MOOC early next year to be involved with one another. And that's where, you know, I think that's where the learning is going to happen is between one another. And, you know, and if, if we have one teacher in one district on the north side of St. Louis and a teacher on the south side, you know, building connections between those two uh, teachers, you know, don't let the LMS be the hindrance, but let them communicate and learn from one another. Um, and I like your idea of the mentor, you know, um, set an expert and a novice together and let the novice be able to share what him or her has to, so that that novice can, you know, blossom into a mentor. Um, that's, that's what we're kind of hoping. And that's where I think the strength of our, the classes I've experienced here at UMSL, that's, I've been a novice in many areas and people have taken me under their wings and I've blossomed. And so that's, I don't want the LMS to be the hindrance. It should be the people, you know, the, and the connections. And so that's where I think the technology should support that. Yeah. Are, are, you, are you using uh, Blackboard for, is, are you planning on using Blackboard for the MOOC development at this point, or, or has it no, been decided? We, well, it was, it's not been talked about because we have to, um, you know, the, we don't want to mix um, the university system um, right, and the uh, MOOC system right. together, it just would create you know a couple nightmares, right. and so we, we wanted to be more open, and we talked a couple diff different platforms, um, but we really haven't settled on one. So um, I'd like to off show. I'd like to or when we get off the air, I'd like to talk to you more about your iterations and right. maybe to find out more about that because it sounds like, I mean. The part that I liked about what you were showing was um, reporting was that you know you, you could already use an existing Google account and right. and the way that the Google has things set up is that it's open and it's collaborative and um, so yeah so yeah yeah that's great uh, Aaron feel free to jump in but I I know I went at, from past discussions that you generally have your eyes rolling back in the, your head when we start talking about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little less familiar with the uh, with the software platforms. <laughs> okay, that's great. So we'll uh, so let's turn to the to the sort of the last issue, which is um, uh, demonstration courses. Uh, and you know, uh, one thing, Aaron, that uh, and I feel free to to comment on this. One of the experiences that I've had, uh, sort of an aha moment, is that um, uh, teaching a class is not so much about the professor trying to teach 
it is about a combination of uh, of gathering gathering support from different people uh getting institutions to work together getting technology to work together um and the problem of putting a course out putting the MOOC out uh, uh, honestly we've got some curriculum that that could go forward easily but the the problem is really figuring out how to engage the academic institutions and the professors uh, at a university to uh, I think it's a cultural shift frankly um, well, so the demonstration courses, we were looking at project-based learning, finding ways to have students themselves develop uh, learning presentations and products, uh, and also using video, video inter interaction with subject matter experts, um, using uh, interview and analysis and demonstration. Uh, full motion video is the easy thing to do with a gigabyte learning environment, so that's primarily the direction that we were looking. The, the four um, topics that, that have arrived or that are being discussed and, and, and developed, frankly, are a course uh, called The Creative Audience, and it's a, a performance art appreciation course. Uh, it's based on a, a, a book, however, the, it's really sort of modified from, the curriculum has modified from the book to uh, to include interviews with performing artists to talk about the dynamic of what an audience means, what an educated audience means to a a perform uh, to a live performer. Uh, the the other course that is being discussed is called Cada Dia Spanish, and it is a daily uh, Spanish conversation where uh, native speakers support the development of conversational uh, language skills. Um, with non-native speakers or people that are just interested in Spanish con conversation. Uh, the uh, model system biology class, and that class is, is uh, Michael, as, as your class is, is a teacher education class, and it's primarily designed to help teachers teach biology in a uh, middle school classroom. Um, and then uh, the digital teaching and learning uh, class, which is uh, kind of an online learning literacy class. Uh, these are all potential uh, MOOCs that are they're being talked about uh, by people that have been involved here. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if you could share just a little bit about the uh, proposal that you that you're working on in at UMSL. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, we started kicking around the idea and what we wanted to do is to offer our uh, professional I teach in, as an adjunct in our College of Education and um, a lot of my students would tell me sometimes that their professional development that I mean the teachers that you know in our ed tech department you know they all hear how some of their professional development opportunities are just um, not up to speed sometimes and so we wanted to um, offer an opportunity for them uh, for practicing, you know, opportunities for our practicing teachers and graduates and community members. And so the focus of our um, MOOC would be uh, flipping the classroom with Common Core examples because both topics right now are highly charged. And so, um, and so we, you know, we're working with a various UMSL faculty and um, centers, the Center for Teaching and Learning and the Center for um, the Technology and Learning Center and many other um, external partners, especially with uh, Con Connected Learning, which is run by uh, Dr. Chris McGee. Um, he runs the Ed Camp um, um, here in St. Louis and also he's involved with the um, Ed Camps in Kansas City as well. And so, you know, he's a curriculum coordinator and so you know these are hot topics in his district right now and so uh to part partner with him and the you know would be a plus but you know we also want to give our don't want to forget about our alumni um through our you know offering this free professional development to make you know one we can give back to the community because we're an urban school and we just want to make sure that 
you know, we give back, you know, so that teachers do have um, good quality professional development because when it boils down to it, I mean, the student is the one that's in the important. And um, so we're hoping for about 200 students to enroll, and we're hoping that 10 students will actually en enroll for the course for college credit and possibly even, um, you know, become graduate students here at UMSL. And uh, Dr. Carl Hoogland, who's... Um, a great mentor. He would be the lead teacher um, for the instruction. And Dr. Keith Miller, who's new at UMSL, he he's very knowledgeable and has expertise in, in in designing large courses and how to automate them so that it does give appropriate feedback and to make sure that it's a good quality course. So we do have a lot of uh, great talents and great things to share. So that's what we're kind of thinking. Great. Um, and it seems like, uh, Michael, that, that we should continue this discussion because it seems to me that the digital teaching and learning course uh, could overlap because it, it is, it could very easily be moved into, well, it could be very easily be used for professional development for teachers. So, um, and, we, and obviously UMKC is a, an urban uh, district is, or uh, urban uh, university as well. Um, and we do have a lot in common with our school districts too. I mean, right? Um, yeah, right. I think I think there's some good overlap there. And has there been any discussion uh, at UMSL uh, regarding the MOOC in terms of uh, collaboration? Um, we've gotten we're. Um, we're starting the conversations with our various on-campus partners to figure out about the credentialing, and um, we want to have those pe the, to get the inner workings first. Um, to, you know, to get those questions of credentialing and what you've been calling the business model, right. uh, to get those irons all worked out first. Um, I mean, we're we're going to offer the course no matter what, but we kind of wanted to. Um, when I was talking with Dr. Chris McGee, you know, his first question to me is like, if we offer this, you know, some teachers are going to, you know, some students who are practicing teachers will say, can I get credit for this? And, you know, that question about, you know, do we offer a badge? What does a badge do? You know, a badge does do a lot for um, self-esteem, but when, you know, a teacher who's working in, and, you know, they, they need deserve, uh, some monetary compensation if we can, you right. know, so that's where the cr credentialing helps, you know. Has, has so, there been discussion about having multiple paths through a one course? So in other words, someone might be doing it for simply enrichment. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a teacher at a private school that doesn't necessarily want the professional development credentialing, but does want the skill sets that are being discussed and then you also have others who are looking just simply for the professional development so they can get more uh, a salary increase and then you have others on a different path that are actually sort of at a graduate level seeking higher understanding in terms of research uh, have you discussed sort of multiple paths through an, an existing course um we have i mean you know with those different paths you know we just um, we do. I mean, that's why um, we're taking a look at the internal workings right now for the, you know, for the the credentialing piece. Um, that's kind of um, that's kind of our main focus right now. But yeah, you, we do have. And how much feedback we do? Do we automate it? Um, do we? Um, so yeah, we 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 are talking about those different uh, tracks. Um, but we we still want to provide you know whoever takes this uh, a good quality uh, professional development opportunity. So we know right. people have different reasons for taking it. So we want to whatever track they pursue, um, we want to make sure it's a good experience. Great. Well, we're getting towards the end of our time. And Aaron, do do you have any final comments before we leave today? No, I you know I think that. Um, the, the opportunity here is very exciting. I'm, I'm curious, Michael, are you working with the Loop Media Hub project at all? I don't know where uh, University of Missouri St. Louis is in the city, and if you're in the, the University Loop or not. Um, we're right by the airport, so I mean, we're, okay. um, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and I, you know, I think the um, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the MOOC space, um, r- regardless of the connectivity situation. I think the interesting opportunity that uh, that you identified and are pursuing, Michael, is you know, can the technology advantages and some of the friction that's removed with the internet experience when you have you know really high bandwidth situations? Um, can, can that help to address or open up some new possibilities in in uh, addressing some of the new questions, and especially the ones that involve um, you know the, the friction between the social part? So, right. uh, a, a frictionless internet um, makes for a, a less mediated interactive experience. Um, but you know that aside, I think. There are some other issues that we can address, irrespective of technology. Um, and I think, to the extent we can collaborate and share learning across the state to do that, I, I think that's very exciting. Well, and, and Aaron, it, I, I just thought I just wrote down frictionless, frictionless learning. Maybe we need to to look. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Maybe we need to look at this opportunity that we have in terms of gigabyte speeds as not so much a tech technical issue, but finding a way to remove the barriers, remove the friction um, to learning. And I think that's actually a really good perspective. Uh, and and also the tell us a little bit more about the Loop Media Hub. Is that basically a gigabyte? Uh, network? Yeah, this is a project um, uh, in St. Louis. Uh, it's sort of a, it's being headed up by a, a business associate of mine, Dave Sandel, uh, who's been involved in some of the planning here um, in Kansas City, uh, civically, but he's been working closely with Washington University uh, and University City when they put in, they're basically putting a trolley um, track, I guess, down two miles of trolley uh, in the, the U-City loop, and they want to put conduit down and lay fiber optic cable and have a, a low-cost gigabit internet service available to the businesses and the residences along that corridor. So um, it's more of, I think, what he calls a, a gigabit main street experiment than a gigabit than a full sort of gigabit city experiment, but I think it's a pretty interesting uh, interesting model, interesting opportunity, and to the extent that we've got that high bandwidth environment in St. Louis, um, you know, I think I think we ought to keep collaborating on that. We're also working with, um, I had a conversation with the libraries in Chattanooga earlier today about uh, a, a software lending library application, um, and I'll be down there next, uh, next month. They've got gigabit bandwidth to all their institutions, and uh, I think this fall we'll be making some announcements about really affordable, ultra-high bandwidth available to residents. And so as more cities like this come online, you know, there's stuff in Lafayette, Google's expanding to Austin and Provo, and at a, you know, sort of city level, we're exploring what that what that means and how we can test some of these things in other markets. But I think, um, you know, if, if UMSL, uh, and I'm, I'm new to pronouncing it that way. That's it. That's it. That's, <laughs> a, that's the way we say it. That can be offered, uh, you know, in a, to, to gigabit home users. There's no reason, you know, they've got the bandwidth on campus. Uh, so it's, you know, in theory, um, this kind of connectivity allows uh, professors and, and institutions to broaden the reach of their content. And so being able to, you know, you guys are doing interesting things in course development, and we can find a way to bring that content to places where people have really high bandwidth connections at home. Uh, I think that's a great opportunity, also. Yeah. Yeah, you you you. It's really, a wonderful invitation. Yeah, you you've uh, you've I think you've opened up a, a great deal of uh, of a discussion of of where you know just as you mentioned in Kansas City we have Google Fiber in Kansas City, but it's perhaps ten thousand homes. Uh, uh, but the issue is, where can we reach with that kind of connectivity? Uh, and the university, uh, the UM system, has a gigabyte network. Uh, 
and if there's also some outreach with the local, uh, the Loop Media Hub in St. Louis, there, there, I think there's some possibilities for connections that um, need to be explored, especially in terms of education. Definitely, because, I mean, the, where the trolley is going are really spots that need it, you know, need the education and the professional development, and they could really benefit from the high speed. That's great. Well, this has been a fantastic discussion. Thank you both very much for being here today. Uh, this has been recorded. Please, uh, um, uh, we will hopefully have another meeting soon. It's been a while. We took a little bit of a break. Uh, so, Aaron, thank you very much for being here, and, and Michael, thank you for being here, and we'll have some more discussions offline. Great. Thanks for being here, Michael. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was nice to meet you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.